And so my uh, interest here is in, uh, first of all, protecting the sanctity of human life. So the church believes that we're all made in the image and likeness of God and that human life begins at the moment of conception. And so we've had a 2,000 year history in our church of being opposed to abortion and holding the sanctity of human life. And at the same time to be uh, concerned for the integrity of the sacraments. So to receive Holy Communion is a very sacred thing in the church and to try to uh, make sure that uh, people are aware of the, of the importance of that moment and not to take it lightly. And so church teaching is that those uh, who are in the state of, of serious sin uh, should not approach Holy Communion uh, because in fact that compounds their sin then and becomes what we call a sacrilege for doing so. So there are two parts of the decree, Canon 915, at which I cite uh, and, uh, in, the, in the case of naming uh, Illinois Senate President uh, John Cullerton and Speaker of the House Michael Madigan for their, uh, as the canon says, uh, obstinate persistence in, um, in, in grave evil and, and serious sin. And, uh, and that would be because of a, a pattern, uh, you might say, of their voting uh, and promoting of this legislation over a period of time, so starting in uh, 2017 when they promoted uh, and, and passed uh, uh, House Bill 40, which uh, provided for taxpayer funding of abortion, and also declared that uh, if, abor if Roe versus Wade is ever overturned uh, in Illinois, that uh, Illinois would continue to be a state where um, abortion would remain legal. And then this most recent legislation, Senate Bill 25, that was just passed last week, declares uh, abortion to be a fundamental right and that an unborn baby doesn't have any independent rights of its own and then also mandates uh, private insurance has to pay for abortion. So it was not only the role of these, uh, these two Senate leaders uh, in, in voting for this legislation but also promoting and facilitating its passage which I would describe as sort of an aggravating factor uh, which then makes them subject to Canon 915 and which says that they are not to be admitted to Holy Communion. The other part of the decree addresses any Catholic legislator who voted for any abortion legislation because the abortion legislation itself would be considered to be seriously sinful. And so even one act of voting for such le legislation would be seen as, as being seriously sinful. And in that case, uh, th that canon, Canon 915, says that they should not present themselves for Holy Communion. So that burden is really on the individual person uh, to have the responsibility of, of recognizing that what they've done uh, is wrong and therefore should not uh, present themselves to receive Holy Communion. And is there any way that this can be reversed, any way that eventually they would be allowed to accept communion? Absolutely, and that's really the hope here. I mean, this is not intended to be punitive. I'm, I'm not interested in punishing people. I'm interested in, in their change of heart, and I would, I would love for them to, to see and recognize that what they did is wrong. Uh, and if they, if they did that, then they should take some step to reverse what they did, because in the church, part of asking for forgiveness is also to make amends for what you did wrong. So when, uh, for example, a person goes to confession and, and confesses stealing, you know, it's not enough for the person to say, I'm, star I'm sorry, I stole the money. If you stole a million dollars, you say, oh, I'm sorry, I stole a million dollars, but I'm going to keep the million dollars. Uh, well, then you're not really sorry. So, uh, the, r the real repentance is to say, I, I took your money, here's your money back. You know, and so in this sense, for a person to have a real change of heart is to say, uh, that uh, legislation that I passed that uh, promoted abortion, I'm really sorry about that, and I, I've come to see that that's wrong. And if that person is still a member of the Illinois General Assembly, then they should take a further step than of actually introducing legislation and trying to get uh, that legislation passed. Okay, and now, do you believe in the separation of church and state? Well, absolutely. I, I do believe in the separation of church and state. And so this is, this is not a, a case of uh, the church trying to tell uh, government officials uh, what to do. It's not intended as a, as a political uh, statement. It is intended, in fact, it's being issued after the vote here because it's a statement really talking about uh, the integrity of what it means to be a Catholic. I mean, there, for a Catholic politician to say that I'm a Catholic, but at the same time I reject what the church teaches about abortion, uh, or I reject what the church teaches about euthanasia or marriage and family life to reject, key teachings of the church is to say that well then you're really not a Catholic in good standing and don't don't claim to be so it's just a question of being uh, consistent about that it's also saying that uh, a Catholic politician should be uh, consistent and if they really do hold the values and the teachings of the Catholic Church that they should make that uh, something that they work for uh, because that's what every politician does 
Every politician, in a sense, runs on a platform. Uh, that's why we have campaigns, and people ask, what are, where do you stand on the issues? Where, does, where do you stand personally? Where does your party stand? And people vote accordingly. And uh, you know, so you, you never have a politician, and I've never heard it said in any other uh, topic or subject that I, I'm personally uh, opposed to racism, but I wouldn't impose that belief on anyone else. Or I, I personally uh, believe in gun control, but I wouldn't impose that belief on anyone else. Yet we hear that uh, repeatedly with abortion. Uh, but I, So I think it's a, a cop-out in a sense. I think it's a specious argument that, that really doesn't hold water. If you really believe something, then that's what our laws are all, all about. Our laws are trying to embody our values and our beliefs. And have you spoken personally with Speaker Madigan or President Cullerton about this situation at all? And you specifically named them in the decree, so mm -hmm. have you spoken to them and given them an opportunity to kind of speak with you about their decisions? I have spoken with uh, Speaker Culler uh, with, with Speaker Madigan on a couple of occasions, and uh, some time ago we spoke about it in a, in a general way. Uh, I called him last week just to basically remind him uh, of the importance of, of this issue, and it was a brief conversation last week. I also reached out to uh, to Senator Cullerton, uh, left a message. Uh, unfortunately, he did not call me back, uh, so I followed up uh, with both of them by sending them, them letters uh, about this. Okay, and is this something common? I believe you issued something similar for Senator Durbin, correct? Well, actually, I inherited a situation with Senator Durbin that uh, preceded my arrival here. So back in 2004, he was told by his pastor at that time and my, and my predecessor as bishop here that uh, he should not receive Holy Communion because uh, of, uh, even at that time, this was 15 years ago, he already had a r rather uh, persistent pattern of supporting abortion rights. When, so when I became bishop here in 2010, I inherited that situation. I upheld it because basically uh, he has not changed his position. In fact, he's continued uh, up until even very recently to, to vote for uh, abortion uh, uh, legislation. And um, so he, in a sense, you might say Senator uh, Durbin is also um, uh, being named, uh, or, or sen the other Senator uh, uh, Cullerton and Speaker Madigan are, are being included in this. Uh, situation along with Senator Durbin because they've all had very uh, similar patterns. And uh, is this common? I mean, is this something that people watching, if they're Catholic and they may be pro-choice, should be concerned that they will be looked down upon by the church? Well, uh, for a Catholic to say that they are pro-choice or promoting abortion, I, I would hope that they would recognize that that position is inconsistent with being uh, a good Catholic, a faithful Catholic. Uh, this has been the teaching of the Catholic Church for 2,000 years now. So uh, back in the first century, uh, the teaching of the Church was that abortion and infanticide were wrong. That teaching has been uh, upheld uh, over the years. So in the Second Vatican Council, a big, big uh, moment in the life of the Church in the 1960s, the Church said that abortion and infanticide are abominable crimes. Um, as recently, as Pope Francis has, has spoken out very strongly uh, about uh, abortion, calling it a very grave sin and a horrendous crime. So I, I think that uh, the Church's message has been consistent on that, and so for a Catholic uh, to say that I'm a Catholic should also come to see that, that is, uh, that's the true position of the Church, and uh, anyone who belongs to the Church, it should be. Did you have to put a lot of thought into issuing this decree? I did. I put a lot of thought, a lot of prayer into it, and um, so I didn't do this very lightly, um, and, but I, I, I did feel myself, uh, as, as a matter of my own conscience, that I have responsibility to do, to do this, and so that's why I, I made this decision. And do you think other Catholic leaders will follow suit? I think there's a good chance of that. The president, um, uh, or the chairman, rather, of the um, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on Pro-Life Activities, Archbishop Joseph Nauman, of Kansas City issued a statement last February in which he said that uh, uh, Catholic politicians who vote for abortion should not present themselves for Holy Communion. And I think the situation has uh, become um, much more um, uh, aggravated in a sense uh, since the last time the bishops of the United States discussed this in 2004. Uh, and at that time, uh, I think politicians were much more reticent about talking that they were promoting abortion rights. I, I think today uh, you have uh, politicians who, are, in fact, are, are, promo are celebrating it. You know, when they pass the legislation, they're hugging each other, giving each other high fives, celebrating the, 
effect that more abortions are going to take place. So they've, they've come uh, the, you know, 180 degrees from saying abortion should be rare to now saying you know, abortion is something to celebrate. And so I think in response to that, uh, I, I think the church leaders will be speaking out more strongly about that. Okay, and then last question is, I'm told that you guys aren't releasing the full list of the Catholic lawmakers that received these letters that they, this decree has been issued, is that correct? The question again? The, it, of, are you going to be releasing the lawmakers that received this letter in addition to Speaker Madigan and President Cullerton, the other lawmakers that voted for this that are Catholic, that are n barred from taking? No, because uh, in, in this case it's, it's simply a reminder to them of, of their obligations as, as Catholics, but uh, I, I, I'm not um, naming them because I think in the case of uh, Speaker Madigan and Sen Senator Culligan, uh, Cullerton, it was a, a case of them uh, by virtue of their leadership position, kind of a, uh, an aggravated um, uh, element to this whole issue, and so that, that's why I singled them out at this point. But the others, it's more just of a reminder to them. Okay. Anything else that I didn't ask that you would like to add? No. All right. Well, thank you very much. You're I appreciate welcome. it.